All right, hello and welcome back. My name is Cameron Kirk and this is um, my tutorial series on using Roblox Studio. Um, if you weren't with us in our last video, we had implemented uh, changing the time of day using the minutes after midnight uh, service. Um, and we had connected that to a heartbeat function and uh, that allowed us to change the time of day now, uh, I guess currently I have it set very slow. Oh, sorry about that. Let me move my head out of the way. There we go. I have mine set to a very slow change, but you can see the sun is setting right now. Um, please go check out my video if you're not sure how to do this. Um, but uh, I'm going to assume you've already completed that video and we're ready to start with creating a clock, a digital clock in this video that is visible to all the players and it will actually show them the current time of day. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, today we are going to be working with the starter GUI and this is basically a folder. If I go back over here, um, we have the starter GUI right there. And this starter GUI is a service it is a singleton, which means it's the only one in your entire game. And you can retrieve it using the get service function. Anyways, anything that's in here is going to be a um, part of the player's GUI or graphical user interface when they respawn. So, um, or when they first spawn in as well. So basically anything you put in here is going to be on the player's screen, uh, sort of as like a heads up display um, to the player. So now that we understand that, um, let's go ahead and stop our game and let's add a screen GUI to the starter GUI. And let's rename this uh, to clock screen GUI. Okay. Um, so now that we have a clock screen GUI, let's go ahead and add a text label. And this text label is going to hold our digital clock. Um, one of the things I want to change on this text label, well, first we have to give it a good name. Let's name this one, I'm gonna name mine time text label. And always, 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 I like to have text scale scaled. There it is, it's this checkbox in the properties. And um, that's going to make the text, whatever size the text is, it's going to fill up the box. And we're gonna make the box scale and position relative to the particular screen that a player might have. I'll show you what I mean in a second. Um, now that we have that, let's go up to, let's see, I wanna do the anchor point. So the anchor point is a little bit hard to explain, but when you see it in action, it starts to make sense. Basically this point is um, the corner or the spot on the box that you want to position it. So we have this absolute position, and right now it's at zero, zero, but if I move this box over here, we're now at the coordinates 375, which is going left and right. We go over to 375, and then uh, Y is 142, which is from top to bottom. So uh, top is zero, and we go down, and we get to 142. And that is from this corner because our anchor point is set to zero, zero. Now, if I set this anchor point to 0 0.5, I want, and this is what we're gonna do, I want to be able to position this box based on the top middle of the box. So right here where I have my cursor, I want to set X to 0 0.5 and I want to keep Y at zero. So now you see the box just jumped over to the left, but our, our absolute position did change, but we are now positioning it relative to this point right here on the box. So the middle, um, top middle of the box. Okay, so with that set up, we're now positioning from the middle of the box. That's what we want. Um, we're going to come down to uh, position 
Well, no, let's do the size first. So under size, we have offset and we have scale. So offset is going to be a fixed amount. So if you're gaming on a small screen, so I click this little uh, button up here and we can look at different screens. So let's say we're on a very small iPhone 4S. Um, you can see 200 pixels wide and 50 pic pixels tall. Um, that is taking up a large portion of the screen. Meanwhile, if we go to a 1080p full HD laptop, that's pretty small. So you can see that we're with offset, we're setting basically a um, real pixel value, and we don't want that. Instead, what we want is we're going to set offset to zero, and for scale, we can set a percentage of the screen. So I'm going to set mine to 25% of the width, and that looks pretty wide, but I think that should be fine. And then for the height, we're going to set the offset to zero, and we're going to do a height of 10% of the screen. So I'm going to do 0 0.1 for Y on the scale. All right. And so now that that is set up, we are ready to set position. So size is good. And, and notice if I go from a 1080p laptop now to an iPhone 4S, which has a small screen, it's still uh, the relative, relatively um, taking up the same amount of space of screen as it was on the um, 1080p laptop. It's relatively the same size. Same thing for an iPad. It's relatively going to take the same percentage of the screen. Okay, so let me turn this off and let's set the position. So the same story goes with the position. Um, you have scale and you have offset. Uh, we're going to make sure offset is set to zero and then for scale I want, I'm sorry, for the X, I want to be in the middle of the screen. So I'm going to set scale to 0 0.5. Sorry, scale for X to 0 0.5. And then for Y, I'm going to set the scale to 0. And by putting Y at 0, we're at the uh, top of the screen. And X to 0 0.5, we're 50% in the middle of the screen. And we can do this little check again to see what it looks like on the different devices. So there's the iPhone and there's the 1080p laptop, and they are basically in the same spot. So it's not going to be uh, floating around anywhere it shouldn't be. Okay, so now that we have that set up, I did want to give a quick example. Let's say you want for your game to be a little bit different than me, and you want to position this in a different spot. I wanted to give a quick example on how to do that. So um, in this example, let's pretend we want the clock to be in the bottom right corner. How we can do that is uh, we're going to set the anchor point to be uh, at the right side of the text box. So I'm going to put X at 1. And so now we're positioning it uh, by grabbing it on this right uh, right edge of the box. And then Y, I am also I also want to grab the box from the bottom. So I'm going to set Y to 1. So now we're positioning it from the bottom right. And you can see the bottom right corner is basically in the center of my screen. Um, what we're going to do is come down now to position. And for X scale, we're going to position this at 100%, which means we're going to go all the way to the right. So now it's all the way to the right corner. And then for the Y scale, we're going to put it all the way at the bottom. So 100% 100% of the screen to the bottom. Now let's say maybe you want it to come in a little bit from there. Um, I believe what you could do is maybe minus 50 on the offset and then minus 50 on the offset and that'll give you a um, fixed um, you know, sort of padding. Um, that's one way of doing it. There's many, many different ways of accomplishing this. But now if I switch between the different screens, here is the 1080p laptop and here is the 4S, which is a small screen. So uh, doing the offset this way, I think 50 is maybe a little bit too big. Let's do like minus 10 pixels and minus 10 pixels. So there you go. Um, so instead of putting it back, I'm actually going to continue the tutorial from having it in this spot. But I just want to give you a couple of ideas of what the process is to move this text label around your screen into a spot and having it stay consistent between different devices that you're viewing your game on. Okay, so 
we are now ready to make a local script on our text label. And this script is going to be responsible for changing the text and uh, giving it the current time of day. So I'm gonna add a local script. Now, one thing that is important to understand is the concept of what the difference is between a local script and a regular script. And in order to understand this, we need to come over to the developer. And I believe there's one on server versus client. The Roblox client server model. So I just wanna find a picture in here. Do not see a picture. Maybe remote functions will explain it. I want to see a picture diagram. You know what? I guess that first page did have a picture that'll work. So let me come up to the top here. So your game, actually, because this is a multiplayer game, Roblox is a multiplayer game, um, your game is going to exist in a few different places at the same time. So as you can see in this picture, it's going to exist on the server, which is in the cloud. And this is what everybody is going to be working off of, is what the game's state is in the server. And then each player has their own device that is also running your game. And these games that are running on, your on the player's devices, these are getting updates from the server. So when you do a local script, your script is going to run on the client side. So if it's an iPad, if it's an iPhone, if it's a computer, um, the code will be executed on that player's device. If it's a regular script, so just the script, that is going to execute on the server. And uh, so if we are updating a graphical uh, user interface or a GUI, um, we want the player to do the work of getting that data and displaying it on their screen. If we were to have a user interface that is opening a store, and maybe that store has like a, a, a scroll button or a next page button, and you go to the next page and you can view more items. If you were to implement this using a server script, what will happen is when you click next page, everybody else who is trying to look at that store, uh, the page is gonna turn for them as well. And that is absolutely not what we want. Um, what we want is my own device and my own set of um, looking at the data and then I get to do what I want to do with the data, which is you know items in your store. So you need to use a local script for GUIs um, pretty much all the time. You want to do local scripts for your GUIs. I don't know of any examples where you want to do a regular script. Anyways, let's not uh, get hung up on that too much. I just wanted to quickly touch on the concept between servers versus clients. Um, yeah, so we're going to click the plus on time text label and we're going to give it a local script. That is important, okay? And then, uh, so the clients are all going to have their own script that run and what this script is going to do is it is going to connect to the server and get the data that says what the current time is and then it needs to display that time to the player. So let's quickly talk about where can we keep our data um, obviously on the server, but where on the server can we keep data for players to access? And the solution is the replicated storage. So the link will be in the description here. Here is the documentation on replicated storage. But basically this is a folder that's available to both the server and to the connected game clients. And you can keep whatever you want in here. Okay, that's pretty much all you need to know. So. Um, replicated storage is found right here in the Explorer. And uh, we are going to be storing data in this replicated storage and we're gonna be retrieving it using this local script. Um, so before we continue though, let's go ahead and give this local script a name. I'm gonna call it clock local script. All right. And then now let's come up to our replicated storage and make a folder. So here is our folder. Let's rename this folder and let's call this folder clock values. And this folder is going to hold our different um, 
data that we're going to download. Um, again, it's just very important you don't leave it called folder um, because as your game gets more and more complicated, you're not gonna know what the heck did you keep in the folder called folder. So let's give it a good name, clock values. All right, and so now let's click the plus on clock values. This is a folder just like on your computer if you're on Windows. Um, let me see here. If you're on Windows, uh, you can, you know, you have your downloads, you have all of your documents and things like that. Um, you just made a new folder and you're gonna store some data in there. So don't have to explain that too much. Uh, let's add in some things to this folder. So we're gonna add a int value. And an int value holds a number and this number uh, can only be whole numbers. So you can't have any decimal points, you can't have any fractions, you can't even have any halves or quarters. You can only have whole numbers, an entire thing of something. Okay, so let's name this first one we created. Let's name it hour. Very good. Now let's go ahead and create another int value and let's call it minutes. So we'll right click on it, rename minutes. Okay, next up we are going to add a bool value. So here is a bool value. Um, so a bool value, if you notice the value property of the bool value, um, it's, either, it's a checkbox, it's either yes or no. That's all you get, you don't get to type in a number here. This is a different kind of data. And the reason why we have a bool value is we want to signal if it is AM or PM. So let's call this AM. So if the AM bool value is checked, that means it is AM. And if it's not checked, that means it is PM. Okay. So now what we need to do is we need to go to our server script service, and this is holding our time script. And if you remember from last time, uh, we set this up in our last video on how to change the time of day. And what we're gonna do in here is we're gonna make a new function. So what, we, what we've done is we have got the time of day, incremented it, and then set the time of day. And what we also need to do is we need to save the time of day into our clock values in the replicated storage. So we have a place to hold the data, um, but nobody is setting the data and we wanna go get the data. So our time script is going to set and then our local script for the player is gonna go get it, okay? Yes, so um, in the developer API on replicated storage, if we scroll down, we can see there should be a code example on how to get the replicated storage. Um, it says get it using the get service function. So let's see if there's an example. Oh yeah, get service. So here's an example of how to do it. Local badge service equal game get service badge service. Copy that. And then at the top here of our time script, we are going to say replicated storage. Replicated storage, there it is. I'm gonna arrow, push the down arrow and then hit tab so that this is highlighted and that will auto complete typing replicated storage. And then instead of badge service, I'm gonna call this RS for replicated storage. And so now we have a variable that has our replicated storage, and that is this guy right here. Okay, the next thing we need to do is we need to get a reference to this folder. So I'm gonna say local, and I'm gonna say CV for clock values, and this will be equal to um, RS, and we're gonna use the colon, and then wait for first child, and then in quotation marks, this is where, I think this is an update, This Autocomplete, I haven't seen that before. That's pretty nice. Um, so we're going to search for clock values and this has to be spelled exactly the same way as you typed it in here for this folder. Um, capitalizations do matter. Okay, and so now that we have a reference to the folder, we want to make some references to our uh, data structures that we have in this folder. So we have a local h, 
and then we're going to do CV, <clears throat> wait for first child, and then in quotation marks, we're going to get hour for H. I like that autocomplete. That's new. I haven't seen that before. Um, now we're going to do a local M, and we're going to use CV, and we're going to do colon wait for first child, or wait for child, and this will be coming out of, what happened? Minutes. Oh, I have a problem here with my quotation marks. There we go. And then we're going to do a local. And then let's call this one AM. It's equal to CV. Colon, wait for child. AM. Very nice. So now we have basically pulled down our variables into our time script and we are ready to set them. Um, so we're going to update the hour, the minute, and the AM variable. Um, yes. And so let's go ahead and make a function here. Let's call this function update clock values. So it'll be local function. And it'll be update, update clock values and push enter. So here is our function. And we are going to update our minute and AM variables um, by passing them as arguments into update clock values. So um, let's uh, go ahead and pass in some variables. Um, let's say this is new hour, new underscore hour. Actually, let's do the camel casing. New hour, new minute, and then new AM. So these get passed in, and then we're going to set them for H, M, and AM. So that's going to look like this. Um, hmm, how do we want to do this? Um, Yes, so H, now you can't just say H is equal to new hour um, because H is not where you actually set it. Um, if you take a look at hour, um, there is a property called value. So to access this property, let's say H dot value. So you're saying H dot value is equal to new hour. We're gonna do the same thing for M, M dot value. It's equal to new minute and am dot value is equal to new am and uh, this is um, these these references we made up here we are setting them here in this function from these arguments here okay so now down here in time step, what we're going to do is we're going to take M, which is holding our new minutes after midnight, because we're setting it here, and we're going to turn it into uh, how many hours is that and how many minutes is that. Um, so we only have total minutes. Um, so to do that, we're going to be starting off by first calculating the hour uh, in military time. And uh, this is going to be equal to math.floor uh, of m divided by 60. So let me talk about this for a second. Uh, we are taking however many minutes there are so far after midnight. So let's say we have 800 minutes after midnight. And we're dividing it by 60. And so this is 13 hours after midnight. Um, we want to ignore the 0.33333 because we don't care about having 33% of an hour. We care about having minutes. So we're going to drop that off by saying math.floor. So when you say math.floor, you're saying just give me the, the round down and give me the whole number. Um, don't round up because if we get to five, we don't want to round up to 14. That doesn't make any sense. So we need the bottom. We need, we need the lower half. We need to round down no matter what. If we're at 13.9, we want to get 13. So this is the hour in military time. Notice that uh, you know it's the 13th hour. 
Uh, if you don't know military time, that is actually 1 p.m. So we still need to do some more work to turn that into um, time like you would see on an analog or digital clock that uh, us everyday civilians use. Okay, so now we need to calculate the minute and the minute is not going to be equal to M because that is the minutes after midnight. Instead, what it's going to be equal to is the minutes after midnight after you subtract out the hours we've taken times 60. So hopefully this makes sense. We have basically just said 800 divided by 60. So we have 13 set for our military. And now what we're doing is we're saying 800 minus 13 times, sorry, uh, oh, I need to switch over to scientific. So now what we're saying is 800 minus parentheses, 13 times 60. And this is giving us the leftover minutes. So 20 minutes is left over. Now, I encourage you to pause and think about this equation I just did. Hopefully it makes sense to you. Um, we were able to obtain the hours that have gone by today so far. And then we use those hours to then calculate how many minutes are left out of the total minutes after midnight. Okay. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's making sense. Good. I just wanted to double check I'm recording. Okay. So now we have the hours and we have the minutes. This is looking pretty good. Um, if you wanted to display military time, you could uh, skip this next part, but I want to do uh, hour and uh, normal time. I don't know what it's called when it's not military time. And to do this, we are going to take the hours and military time and uh, modulate that with 12. So we're using the percent sign here. Modulus, um, I don't want to spend too much time explaining modulus, but basically, um, if you know, I know a great way of explaining it. Uh, if you have done long division, then you know what modulus is. So if I had 17, ooh, messy handwriting, divide by four, uh, we know that this can go into that four times minus 16. And we have one left and we say, we're not going to do decimal points. We say that is a remainder of one. And then four, sorry, uh, 16 can be divided by four, four times with a remainder of one. So like, uh, I'm sure you've seen like the math where like you have four friends, you need to divide these up equally. Each one can get four based on our math and we are actually going to have a remainder of one. And so what the percent sign gives you, percent, this is actually going to give you the remainder. So if I said, um, if I wrote it this way, um, not that way, delete. If I wrote it this way, if I said 16 divide by four, well, that is this equation right here. We just did that. And if I said 16 modulus or percent sign four, that is going to be equal to this guy. Um, I may do a follow up video if people are interested in me explaining modulus more, but I think I'm going to stop here. Hopefully that makes sense. Just know that when you type this command 16 percent four, it's going to give you whatever the remainder is. So sometimes that remainder can be zero. Um, sometimes that remainder can be more, but that remainder will never be, it will never be four or more. It's going to be zero, one, two, three. And that's just how it works out because if you happen to have a remainder of four, well then you, you did your math wrong because then, uh, you need to, uh, you know, do a plus one on that. If you have another four, you can dis distribute that among your friends equally, right? Because you have four friends, right? Anyways, okay, I said I wouldn't spend too much time here. Sometimes I can get off on tangents. I don't want to make this a long video. So we have 24 hours in military time, and we're going to say modulus 12 
um, and we're going to get the remaining time. Uh, every time there's been 12 hours, give me the remainder. So how much is left over? Trust me, it works out. Trust me, it works out. Um, okay, so if our norm uh, is exactly equal to zero, then what we need to do, there's no zero o'clock in normal time. We go midnight and then we go 1 a.m. So if we have a zero, we need to set this um, our norm equal to 12. Um, because 12 modulus 12, so 12 divided by 12, 12 divided by 12 is equal to one with the remainder of zero, right? Because 12 minus 12 is zero. There's zero left over. So the remainder is zero. So we're saying if we have a remainder of zero, then we need to set that to 12, right? Because otherwise it'll go uh, 11 p. It'll go 10 p.m., 11 p.m., 0 p.m., or 0 a.m. Anyways, just trust me here. Um, let's go ahead and print out what we have. So let's print out our military and let's print out our normal. Okay. Let's hit play. Let's see what we got. So according to this, the military time is 14 and the normal time is 2 p.m. So now we're at 1500 hours and we have 3 p.m. Okay, let's make time go by faster and let's see what we get in terms of all our values. So recall that to make time go faster, you change this rate per second. I'm gonna do 100. I can type 100 per second. Okay, so we see our clock is ticking here. And it's looking pretty good. So let's stop it here. So we can see that in our output, we said 0, 0,100 hours is 12. For a second, it did say 24, 12, but then it reset to 0, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then when the military time goes to 13, we go back to 1. So this is looking pretty good. We're, we're focused on that right column there as displaying it as a digital clock. Okay. Now the only other thing that we haven't set yet is our AM PM. So let's go ahead and do that now. We can delete this print statement. So if our military is less than 12 hours, so less than 1200 hours have gone by, then we are going to call our update clock values function and for new hour we're going to give it the number hour norm and for new minutes we're going to give it the value minutes so we're giving this guy and we're setting this guy equal to this guy man i love this update look at how nice and neat it is to see that function i love that this reminds me of Visual Studio Code when it gives me the prompts for in Python. When I'm coding in Python and it tells you, this is a nice update. This is new. I haven't. Uh, it says, what's new? Let me see this. Full release of pathfinding modifiers, developer modules, updates, new modules. I gotta go read that later. This is this is this is amazing, guys. I like this a lot. Okay, and the new AM. Remember, our new AM is a Boolean value. We're going to give it, we are going to give it uh, a hard-coded value. We're going to say if, if our military is less than 12 hours, that means we are in the AM. So we're going to give it true. And then we're going to say else. So in all other situations where our military is greater than or equal to 12, then we're in PM, right? We are in PM. So let me just copy this guy. There we go. And PM means AM is false. We are not in AM. Very good. So 
if we hit play, I don't know if we can actually go inspect this in our game, but I'm gonna hit play and then in the Explorer, in the replicated storage, I'm gonna click on clock values. I'll click AM and that has a checkbox. Let me go to the hour and the hour is changing. You can see it right there under the value property. Very nice. <clears throat> okay, so now we're ready to code our local script. Finally, this is the local script, finally, finally. And we need to bring over some of our code from the time script. So at the, at the top of our time script, we did all of these guys. So we get the replicated storage, we get the clock values folder, and then we get the H, M, and A, M. Let's copy that and paste it in our local script. Save us a little bit of time. Um, we also want to create a reference to the parent of our script. So we're going to say local um, text. Let's let's actually call this variable label is equal to script dot parent. There we go. Oh my gosh, that is new. If I say script dot parent, it's telling me the parent is a text label. And that's true. That is so cool. I wonder if I do dot parent. It does. It even tells you what the parent of that is. So if you do another dot parent, that's a screen GUI. That is very nice. I like that. I'm excited. This is a nice surprise. Okay. So um, create a reference of the parent of the script. Okay. Now we are going to create a function and let's call it set clock. So we're going to say function, oh, sorry, local function uh, set clock. There we go. And we're going to connect this with an event. And this event will be when that int val changes. So let me, the link will be in the description for this. But if we look at the uh, developer API for int value, recall that int value is what we put in our replicated storage for hour and for minute. Um, so if we look at this, uh, under the functions, there is a, where is it? Why am I not? Oh, here it is, events. Um, and there's a changed event. So this event will fire whenever the int value dot value of the int value is changed. And say that five times quickly. But basically, this uh, this will run a function that you connect uh, if the value and the int value changes. And we have our server changing that int value. So if we connect our local function to the event when that changes, uh, we can update the values. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, if we click on event changed, does it give us an example code? Yes, it does. Let's copy this. We already have this first part. Um, we already have a reference to the end value we want to connect to. So let's copy the second part and go back to Roblox. And at the very bottom, underneath our set clock, we're going to paste this. And then they did this inline function. I really don't like those. Those look so messy. We're going to copy, set clock, and paste it in there. Just the name. Do not do the open close parentheses because that does not work. You need the, just the name right in there like that. Now value doesn't exist in our code. And what we want is every time the minute changes, we need to update everything. Let's update all of our variables that are being displayed on the screen. So we're gonna put M here. We're gonna connect to every time the minute goes by because um, we're not we're not showing seconds, we're just showing minutes. Every time the minute goes by, we're going to display the current hour, the current minute, and the current AM, PM on the screen. Okay. So let me catch my breath for a second. Um, the other thing we want to do is when the player joins, uh, there's going to be you're going to have to wait for a full minute, and depending on how slow or fast you make time go by. Um, that could take a while. So let's just call set clock. So as soon as the player or the client is connected, we want to just run set clock to immediately set the values to for the first time. And then from then on out, we're going to update them from there. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to 
remember we made that label, which is script.parent. And if we click on time text label, there is a field, there is a field for text. There is a text field. And right now it's set to label. So if we look on here, it's set to label. I can add a CX um, or something. I can put a CK, um, whatever. Uh, when we type in there, that changes what is being displayed. And that is what we want to control from our script. I'm going to put that back on label. Okay, so let's make a empty string in our script, sorry, in our function. And let's call this AM PM. And it's an empty string. So I'm just going to put quotation marks with nothing in it. So if am and this is am our variable up here dot value so if the value um, has a checkbox then what we're going to do is we're going to set am pm am pm equal to am because am had a checkbox am dot value had a checkbox else am pm and you can take a wild guess what i'm going to put here Otherwise, it's going to be PM. Very good. And then now we're going to say local, and we're going to call this clock string. And we're going to use string format. So string dot format. And where I'm getting this from is, once again, from the Roblox developer API. The link will be in the description. Um, this is a thing that will allow you to format a, um, a string of text um, using variables. So convert variables into user-friendly string of text. And here are some examples, but we're not gonna read this. We're just gonna follow along with me for the sake of time. Uh, I'm gonna do quotation marks and we're gonna do percent 0.2i. Um, and then we're gonna do a colon and then we're going to do a percent. This is going to look really mysterious if you haven't read the uh, documentation for uh, string format. Um, but I will give you, I'll give you the short story, but I do encourage you to go check it out. So this is basically the pattern of our string that we're going to build using string format. This is the pattern. And when you see a percent sign, that is basically saying like, this is a keyword, this is a code word, and I want you to replace what follows with the variable. Um, and that variable is going to be the hour. So let me just finish typing. We're gonna do hour.value, we're gonna do minute.value, and we're gonna do am pm text. So we're getting this am pm text and we're showing that. So every time you see, every time you see a percent sign, that is a variable that is going to be displayed. Um, so I is for integer. 0 0.2 just means I want you to show um, no decimal points and I want you to show two um, significant digits. Um, so the ones place and the tens place. So we have this one here, which is going to be showing H dot value. And then we have a colon, just like on a digital clock. And then we have M dot value, and that is going to be this one here. And then lastly, we have a string and percent %s is for place a string here. And uh, that's looking pretty good. We're not quite done yet because now what we need to do is we need to take label and we need to set its dot text property. So label dot text. Remember, label is our time text label. And there is a property in here. I showed this earlier. There is a property in here called text. And we want to set that equal to our clock string. Cool. And we are done, believe it or not. This was actually a, a, how long are we in? Oh goodness, we're 44 minutes in. Hopefully this wasn't too long. Let's quickly hit play and make sure everything is working. I set a break point on accident. Oh no, resume. Go back to the game. And there it is. So let me get this full screen. Yes, there it is. All right, so we have 7 p.m., 9 p.m., oh, midnight, yep. And there it goes. 
And now the sun is rising at, where's the sun? Oh, it's already 10 a.m. Oh, time goes by pretty quick in this game. Um, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.